This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Welcome to the Shock Factor. I'm your host, Dave Shock, and today we have Rich Hoffman. Rich grew up in the Dayton, Ohio area and has been researching UFOs for 52 years and living near Wright Patterson Air Force Base, the home of Project Blue Book, and of course the fabled Hangar 18, as many know, from the Roswell crash debris was taken. And at age 15, he appeared on the Phil Donahue show. Amazing, at age 15. And uh, has become a local UFO expert around that time. And when MUFON formed, he quickly joined and has uh, been on numerous positions in MUFON ever since. He currently is state director for Alabama for MUFON. And is project and is the strategic projects coordinator. And was recently part of the star team manager. And with that, we welcome Rich Hoffman. Rich, welcome to the show. Hi, glad to be on with you, Dave. How are you tonight? I'm doing real good. Uh, getting a little late this evening. Uh, it's good to have you on. Uh, Rich, I wanted to start off with uh, uh, how in the world did you ever become a UFO expert at age 15? That's just fantastic. <sighs> it's a crazy story, but uh, final mind for me was that um, – Actually, it was age 13 that I got started. Uh, I was late for a, a, a science class, a, my eighth grade science class. And a uh, teacher had handed out a list of subjects you're supposed to pick and do a, a report and actually do an interview or a, like a presentation in the class. And the only thing that was left that nobody had signed up for was UFOs. And so I... I had no idea what they were. I didn't even know what that meant. Uh, I went up after class and talked with my science teacher and said, you know, what's a UFO? And he said, well, it's unidentified flying object. And he mentioned uh, that, you know, that's some people call them flying saucers and stuff like that. And I just said, well, okay. And I really wasn't that much interested in them. I didn't think that there was anything about them. I had never read anything about them. And so bottom line was I started to, prepare for that 10 minute presentation that I was supposed to give. And, uh, but I really didn't prepare very well because ultimately I just, you know, I, I think I might've got a book on like my trip to Venus or something like that. And, <laughs> you know, and I, and I, and I just really disregarded it. Um, I think I, I remember looking at something in the encyclopedia on it and I saw something about that. Anyway, I took what little I had went and did my 10 minute presentation. And I remember saying something like, you know, that, there really uh, not much to it, and it's a strange book that I read. And anyway, the, the teacher hit me up with all kinds of questions, like, "Well, what about the jet pursuits? Uh, what about uh, landings? What about this? What about?" And obviously, he knew all about the subject, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I just got decimated in front of the class, and and uh, he could really tell that I had not done anything. So I got my D that day on the report. Um, <laughs> <laughs> went went home that e went that home that evening and uh and uh, and then Walter Cronkite came on and was talking about the Socorro New Mexico case and uh, uh and that that was twenty fourth nineteen sixty four and and I, when I listened to that on the news I just like was like just it, it hit me like wow there's there are landings and there is something there. And it's just, it was really weird to hear all the discussion about what he had seen. Well, for me, it was a situation where I, you know, now I caught my interest a little bit more. And um, I know a couple of days after that, my, my aunt uh, picked me up and uh, she had taken me 
she took me to a bookstore, I guess, or something like that. And I remember going into the Wilkie's news agency in Dayton. I don't mm-hmm. remember that. I remember not. Wilkie's, oh yeah. Yeah, you remember Wilkie's? Anyway, yep. so I went I went to Wilkie's and I and I that was the, the news and books and everything else downtown and Anyway, I went in and started looking around, and there was this book uh, that was a, called The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by a former head of Project Blue Book, which was Captain Ruppelt, and Edward Ruppelt. And I, I started to read this book, and I'm just, you know, my mouth was like hanging down because I was realizing that all this is about a project that's allegedly just up the street at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And... Man, that just hit me like left and right. That here I am sitting in the uh, in the in this you know city that where there's this project, and if the Air Force is really looking into it, then there must be something to it, right? Yeah, um, well, we we both yeah. grew up around there, and you know, so I yeah. had the same feeling over the years. You know, was the crash victims there, the debris from Roswell, this and that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm for me, Dave. It, it just like was like wow. It, this was like overwhelming, and and, and you know, at the age thirteen, you're pretty much you know, like I guess you're very uh, much willing to go on and to to just go into whatever you know, and and, and so I it propelled me big time into the subject and I started, you know, going after and doing newspaper clippings and started reading as much as I could get. I started buying books. I started, you know, doing everything I could to, to learn as much as I could about the subject. And I mean, I remember even going around uh, at, at school and I had like a briefcase and I even wrote the word UFO on the side of it. And, and all the <laughs> my classmates were all like, you know, oh my God, this guy is going off the deep end. But, um, uh, and, and then I Somehow I got connected into uh, the down at, at the Museum of Natural History. I ended up getting invited out to do a, a This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at www.drgibbswilliams.com. Shamanism is recognized as a method to access the quantum level. Mastery of shamanic skills puts spiritual information and healing power into your hands. Path Home Shamanic Art School, a bonded Colorado certified occupational school, has met rigorous state standards ensuring its director and instructors have the qualifications to teach the shamanic arts. Path Home offers a certification program in blocks of study. Block 1, a five-day intensive, will be held in the beautiful mountain town of Coldale, Colorado, October 13th through 18th. Registration deadline is September 12th. 
Experience Journey Trance, Power Animals, Helping Spirits, Sacred Space, and Life Purpose. Come discover your power. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, in the magical world of shamanism. Call 303-775-3431 or visit findyourpathhome.com. Welcome back to the Shock Factor. We have Rich Hoffman on tonight. And, uh, Rich, we was just talking about <laughs> how you pretty well began on all this. and the, uh, It's an amazing story. Uh, if you can continue, go right ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, anyway, bottom line was that I started doing presentations around the city of Dayton. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and the next thing I know, I was like, you know, being asked to come and speak here and there. And I started doing it. And then, uh, one thing led to another. Uh, I kept learning. At age 15, somebody had heard me speaking, and they said, "Well, we'd like to." We talked with somebody at the TV or TV station, uh, a guy named Phil Donahue, and would you be interested in coming on the show? And I said, "Yeah, well, sure." Um, so I ended up on the Phil Donahue show in Dayton, uh, and then, then kind of like after that, uh, it I guess people started to connect me with UFOs. And the next thing I know is getting phone calls about everything that goes bump in the night. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like and, and, you know, yeah. I mean, Did I Phil had Donahue uh, call you again. <laughs> uh, well, he never got me, uh, got back in touch with me anymore. <laughs> okay. And after that, I but I mean, seen one or <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, to me, it was like one of those things where then, then it was, it was like just you know, every other radio station and TV and date uh, and Dayton just yeah. was constantly pulling me on and, uh, and I was doing a lot of interviews and, and then I was still trying to do presentations. But to me, the, the, the big thing was for me to actually, I was looking forward to investigating them and getting to know more about the sightings. And so, well, sure. Yeah. So, I, yeah. So that's where I, that's, and that's kind of like how I got into it, Dave. I mean, it's just kind of like one of those things where I stumbled into it at an early age. Oh, uh, you said you was on a show of a mutual friend of ours, Dr. Creep back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Creep. Yeah. I remember him. I, I've even got a picture here where, where he signed it for me and stuff like that. I was on his yeah. show a number of times, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. I knew him from back in the day when I was buried alive, back uh, back when I was 15 years old for <laughs> the first time. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, gosh, yeah, I knew Doc forever and uh, didn't know if he was into the UFO scene or not, but... Uh, What's yeah, that? he was. Well, he was always interested in, and him and I would talk, and it would be, you know, we just carry on, and he would want to know more, and he was always curious about it. And, um, but you know, of course, he was always doing those like late night science fiction shows and stuff like <laughs> yeah. that. You know. Yeah, we love shock theater. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. No kidding. Yep. Shock factor here. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Yeah, you kept yeah. up with this tradition. Yep. I, guess. I was never on his show though. After all, oh, you weren't. Should have been. No. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> but uh, uh, let's see. Now, you had spoke at the MUFON Symposium in Florida here recently about the 2013 Puerto Rico incident. Now, can you tell us about that? Sure can. Uh, yeah, that, I, uh, myself and, and five other scientists, if you would, or people who are science-based, got together. And we've spent uh, two years basically analyzing a video the video was uh, a three minute and 54 second video that actually was provided to us uh, from a pilot who is with Homeland Security and basically Customs and Border Protection. And apparently on the night of like 20, the 25th of April, uh, 2013, uh, there was an incident that took place where uh, this other pilot and their flight crew, they have like four people uh, aboard these uh, planes. And they're actually basically their mission is to go out and look for smugglers because Puerto Rico is a hotbed of uh, bringing in drugs. Sure. And it's close it's, to the U.S. Yeah, it, it, well, exactly. And because of its relationship, uh, all these countries were trying to, you know, they use that as their means to get in the United States. Anyway, the, the gist of it was that uh, they were taking uh they were taking off at about 9.16 that evening. It was, it was, you know, of course it's dark. Um, and 
As the plane got up uh, in the air, uh, the pilot looked to the left and saw this light that was out in the distance. And it was starting to come toward the airport. And this is in the, the area called, uh, uh, well, north of Aguadilla. Mm -hmm. uh, it's at the Rafael Hernandez Airport, which is in that very northwest corner. Uh, so the gist of it is that they, they, they got up to a, a certain level. I saw this light, the pinkish red light that was coming in. And the pilot contacted the control tower and said, hey, like, what's going on? There shouldn't be anything coming into my airspace, but I'm seeing something. And they're saying that we see it too. Um, and they, so they confirmed with him that, uh, that they saw it. And the pilot started to go and fly around in a counterclockwise maneuver to just keep their eye on it. Um, and the suddenly, the uh, after a period of time, after they made one full circle, uh, they got back to about the position almost where they took off at the uh, the end of the runway again. Um, now they're noticing that the light goes off, uh, and. Now they're thinking, well, maybe they got a, a drug smuggling aircraft. So the, yeah, uh, I mean, the footage is amazing. I, I have seen the footage when it came out. I remember it. Yeah. yeah. So then what happened is that they flip on the, the infrared camera. It's a West Cam MX-15 uh, camera that's mounted underneath the, uh, the uh, de Havilland Canada 8, or they call it the Dash 8 aircraft. Um, anyway, it, that's when they flip on the, the camera. And now they make another tighter circle in a counterclockwise position. And that's the three minute and 54 second footage that you see. So they've made, they made two loops around the airport. And all you're seeing on that video is the second loop that they're doing. Anyway, that, it's at that point you see the 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 infrared image of this whatever this object is of course everything looks like it's daylight uh but yeah it's because of thermal it's infrared, so right. yeah and so anything that you see that's dark is is the hot they have the setting on hot is dark and and the cool is yeah, is lighter white color. basically okay. lighter lighter color and so that's when you begin watching this thing and it appears as though that the object comes in circles around the airport as they're doing the circle uh and then and then the next thing, it, it has the appearance of it going out toward the water. Uh, and then you have, uh, after that, it then goes and it's moving along the shoreline. It's changed its position now. It's going uh, parallel to the shore uh, where it was going up toward the north. And now it's, now it's going along the shoreline and you see it then apparently go underneath the water you see an image of the actually what is the the wave that's being produced. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, which gives I've you seen kind that. of a ghostly white image, uh, and then you see it. Uh, the cameraman zooms back out again, and then he sees it in his crosshairs. And the next thing you know is it, it the intensity of the heat increases and starts to double. And at that point, it goes bipolar. And the next thing you know, you have, it, or bimodal. And it, now you have two identical objects. It's almost like a, you know, like like a cell division, if you would. Where Yeah, that's what was where, odd. It was ended up two of them all of a sudden. Like. Yeah, so now you got two of these things with, uh, you know, uh, that are moving through the water. And one goes trailing off and then goes into the water, or at least it disappears. And then the other one kind of hangs up. The original one, if you would, kind of hangs up for a little bit. And then finally it goes away and it's gone. Uh, and so with that, you know, you start to see something like that. We, we needed to, we wanted to dedicate as much time as we could. And we formed a team, like I said, uh, of people that had to sign non-disclosures and we, we could mm -hmm. contact the, uh, the, the gentleman that was the pilot that we, who contacted us. Yeah, um, I mean, this is Homeland Security footage. That's what makes it so extraordinary. Yeah, and we got that confirmation in a FOIA request that it was actually their video. Because we, were, we weren't sure if it was a fake. We weren't sure if it, if it if indeed it was, you know. And we had to, to verify that. And what helped us out was we got the radar. So we actually oh, got radar. We actually have a radar. There is, it is actually on radar, though. 
Yeah. I mean, well, not uh, so. What you have is we got radar, which showed the actual aircraft, and we actually looked at the transponder code for the aircraft and found mm-hmm. out that that matched Homeland Security uh, uh, right transponder call. Right. Codes. Yep, yep. And then the other part of that is when you watch the actual uh, radar uh, prior to this, you see from a roughly around nine o'clock or so in the evening until about nine fourteen over 40 or, or something like that, over 42 hits of an object that was moving around at, and doing some incredible speeds uh, northwest of the air, of that airport. And so- How far northwest was that? Uh, was well, it, was, it was just like no more than like about a mile and a half maybe or something. So it was just off the shoreline. So uh, it was getting some radar returns. Yeah. In oh yeah, well, we, I mean, it's definitely an object that suddenly when it goes away, then you have this, you know, now border protection aircraft going up and it's now seeing this light. And so that's uh, the, the other thing went away and now this one shows up and now they're tracking this, you know. And then the other part of this equation is that when the uh, apparently it was too low to be able to get the radar, the radar was actually 90 miles uh, southeast of the airport, the one that picked it up. And uh, apparently it was too low to be able to be picked up any further on the on the uh, radar image. But you have that, then you have it going along the shoreline. And like I said, you're watching on the camera as this thing disappears. And so what, after it did the split and all this other stuff and it goes mm-hmm. away, what disappears? And then that's where you're, when you sit back, Dave, and you start looking at this and you say, well, is this a bird? Is this a plane? Is it a balloon? Is it, what is it, you know? And yeah. You, well, what the pilots say it looked like visually and instead of on the camera, could they actually see it visually? No, there was, I mean, this was like, at not, well, they saw it when the light was on, you mm-hmm. know, but when the light went off and, I mean, this is nine o'clock at night or nine, right. you know, nine at night. So it's, you know, they can't see anything. Right. Uh, it's so just thin. Um, the only yeah, thing that they're, I mean, they have a display that they're looking at. Uh, the pilots right. got can see it up on the front dash that he's got. He's got a display. And then they, the thermal Im- the camera imager in the back, the, the guy that's operating that is basically seeing it. Uh, and they're watching it. In fact, he's manually tracking the, the object. Uh, they didn't have the laser target illuminator turned on, but they were actually tracking it uh, that way. Um, and then, of course, you have all this great metadata that shows up on the video, which I'm sure that you saw as well. If you exactly. Watched it. Yes. Uh, you know, and then you're able to, to do some actual, you know, I mean, now you can actually do some GPS coordinates and you can start to figure that out. You right. Timestamp. Everything is on the video. And, right. And, and so we spent the two years analyzing the 7,027 frames. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in minute uh, detail, by the way. Well, I mean, two yeah. years, like you said, I bet. My gosh. Yep. 7,000 frames. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we... Then we uh, the video is amazing. I mean, it really is to watch yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't believe the hours that were put in. I mean, we were literally on the on talking to each other, of, you know, like basically every every two weeks we'd get together and, and have a chat, and, and we were comparing constant emails with each other and analyzing this and analyzing that. And we had a physicist, well, we've had uh, mathematicians, we had chemists, we've had all different kinds of people that that were out there that were helping. And uh, and then we we uh, pretty much looked into a lot of others. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, hey, uh, yeah, we got to take a break here in a moment, but uh, everyone, we're here with Rich Hoffman this evening. And uh, this is really, truly interesting. So uh, make sure you come back and you're listening to The Shock Factor on the X-Zone Broadcast Network. Thank you. Come on back. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, High Tech with Corey Kay, and every minute of the 24-7, 365 programming of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 712-432-9459, courtesy of TalkStream Live. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. 
call 712-432-9459 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 712-432-9459 for the best of paranormal, new age, thought-provoking, sci-fi radio programming 24-7, 365. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Back to the shock factor. We have Rich Hoffman on. <laughs> Rich, uh, move on. Uh, you're you're been with move on from the beginning. Uh, actually, from the beginning, you're probably one of the first people that joined move on. Is that true? Well, I got in there pretty quick. I you know I obviously like uh, I was at the time uh, when Project Blue Book was still running until '69, and I was actually doing things on pretty much on my own at that time, uh, and then I would even be going on case investigations and have a, a guy sitting next to me that was an Air Force guy, and he was doing the same investigation that I was. Uh, that was kind of an interesting experience. And then I got to also know some of the people at the base, and uh, and they would actually let me contact the uh, radar approach control to confirm sightings and stuff like that. No so, kidding. They would actually yeah. let you, do, for Wright Patterson, they would let you do that. Yeah. Yeah, they were very cooperative. I, I, you know, I guess after I got to know them pretty well, and you know, and stuff like that, they were they were pretty cooperative. In fact, later on, I actually went out and did uh, presentations uh, on UFOs to the people down in the Foreign Technology Division area and and some of the other area uh, Area B personnel. So yeah, they got to know me pretty well. Um, 
anyway, the, the gist of it was that I was looking for an organization and I knew that NICAP was out and so was APRO and, but um, I, I think I joined NICAP. I never really got into doing anything really for them. I just was one of those member paid member types of things. And then, sure. And then uh, I remember reading in 1969, and this is about the time that the project was just before that was being terminated um, at the Air Force. Of course, that's the uh, Colorado study and stuff like that was going on and, and, and finalized yeah. and stuff like that. But, but the gist of it was that, that I uh, then uh, found out about a, an organization called the Midwest UFO Network. And it was just starting up. And, of course, I'm in Ohio. And I thought, well, Midwest, you know, that sounds Hey, good. Midwest, that's close. Yeah. <laughs> that's close. And so I, I, jo I joined, uh, and that began the, the history of uh, – at that time, it was in uh, Quincy, Illinois, uh, and Walt Andrus and stuff like that was there and, and managing it. And, of course, I, uh, you know – Eventually got to know Walt. I went to some of the symposiums and stuff like that, the conferences that they had, which were a bit smaller. But uh, anyway, the for the most part, I just, you know, uh, was working now with them. And I then I became the state section director for Dayton, Ohio and Montgomery County. And that whole area uh, was all under me for for investigations and stuff. And I was also with uh, working with another organization on the side called the Ohio UFO Investigators League, and I was the director of investigations for them. And this was just a, a group of people. You were that, young then. You're the director. <laughs> yeah. How do you like that one? I mean, uh, so suddenly I'm like helping to do investigations and training others to do investigations. And I needed to because by the time 73 rolled around, we got slam dunk. Uh, with sightings. I mean, there were literally hundreds of sightings coming in each week. 73. Yeah, in 1973. And that was the, in fact, Len Stringfield wrote a, a book about uh, pretty much the 73 cases called The uh, Situation Read, The UFO Siege. Uh, and in fact, you'll see me in there. I'm doing a lot of cases. Uh, there's a picture of me and I mentioned a whole bunch of times because I had been investigating a lot of cases around the Dayton, Ohio area. And so he matched up and he put a lot of stuff in it. So anyway, to make a long story short, I ended up then, uh, you know, pretty much doing that. And then uh, 1978, we held the uh, uh, the MUFON Symposium in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, had something like 3,500 people that showed up. We, uh, we, we rented out the entire, well, you, you could appreciate this, we rented out the entire Dayton Convention Center and had it completely full of people. We also had the, uh, I think, the, was it a Marriott or something like that that was attached to it? Yes, yeah. I mean, that place, right we there. had rented out home of that whole hotel. I mean, it was just amazing how much we had done. But uh, there was so much excitement and interest in the UFO subject because, you know, Project Bull Book was out there and everything else that, well, we had the TV show too come out there in the early seventies about what was it? It was called Project Blue Book, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it's a series. Yeah, it was all about their 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 little investigations and stuff, and yeah. always left scratching your head. <laughs> so the interest, like watch that. the interest was high, Dave. I mean, literally, and so that's why we were able to fill that that kind of a space. Right now, we can barely get like four hundred people to come to some of these things, but but you know, that was quite a bit. Uh, of attention and we had the, of course the news media and everybody else was out there and it was great it was attended by uh we had uh dr heinick speak at it we had uh, uh donald kehoe i i went and picked him up wow. at the airport. uh kehoe and this is like one of the last times i'd seen him you know and doing much of anything but he was there and we had uh len stringfield he was about to uh, talk about the crash retrievals that he had been studying for years and um, he was going to be making a big announcement about that at that. And so it was a lot of, lot of uh, intensity, and it was a really exciting time. I bet so. You were still young, and here you are a big part of this, you know. Yep. <laughs> uh, it's fantastic. I guess still oh, – weren't you a nervous wreck going on the Phil Donahue show? 
Well, that was 15 a, years old. <laughs> yeah, but you know something? I was a brash, you know, uh, no holds barred, you know, 15 year old. I, I I felt I knew the world and I you know I could control it. And <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just one of those things where you're you know you you get to the point where I had an extremely high confidence level that I could answer any of those questions and decimate anything that he probably threw at me. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's just that, you know, that naivete that you got, you know. You know I've seen that video uh, you posted there, oh gosh, earlier this year. What was it? Uh, it was Channel 22 back yeah. in the day. Channel, back Channel, in the day on Channel 22. Yeah, there in Dayton. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I, you know, I vaguely remember that, too, because we only had, what, three, four stations in Dayton, you know, at the yeah. time. or what cable, really, then, so... That's right. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sure I, I seen it and just barely remember it though back in the day. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. It I was really on, do you remember uh, Channel 7's Gil Whitney? Oh, of course. Yeah, the Woolly Worm guy. Yeah, the Woolly Worm <laughs> guy. Well, he got, he was really interested in the subject and I kept getting pulled on his. He had what they call a summertime series show that basically he would bring in all these people that were either coming into town to be in the plays. Yeah. These yeah, were I remember that. Sure. Made, so I got to meet, you know, I got to be on a bunch of those shows. I was on with Tom Bosley from Happy Days. I was on with Pearl Bailey and uh, Jimmy Pearl. Coco and Dodie Silly. Goodman and Peter Strauss. And, and I got to meet a lot of these people. And, and it was just a, a hoot, you know, just to be on with them. But at the same time, you know, to, to chat with them about UFOs. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, now a lot of stars are really, uh, they, they like the subject. But they won't speak about it publicly. You know, there's a few of them out there, and we have a few rock stars that are into oh, it yeah. nowadays. Well, I got a kick out of it. Uh, yeah, when, Sammy Hagar, well-known uh, a yeah. rock star, and he's actually outspoken about it itself. Tom DeLong wrote the book Secret Machines and says he has inside info, and they're going to have him do the disclosure. But <sighs> I just don't know about that one. If I can buy that or not. <laughs> Oh, no, pick a rock you. star out yeah and say you're going to be the one that's this young fellow who's a grunge rock star and he's going to be the one to do it i don't know if he's he's doing this on purpose to make money off this book which he has a whole series he's going to be writing on them so you know it sounds to me more like money but i you know i can't say I, hard to say maybe they do maybe they are <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I'm with you. Um, to me, it's like I did, uh, you know, I, I put up with it, but I really, like I said, I, I was not into this. Let's create a big ego. Let's go out and, you know, do uh, do the TV radio thing all the time. And, you know, and, and I wasn't looking for any of that. To me, the the, it, I, the reason I got into it was because I was interested in UFO. And so I, I kind of like pushed away from that. Eventually, I just said, I, you know, I'm, I'm, this is nice, but I don't, I don't want to go on the road. I don't want to do it. I, I want to be able to study UFOs, and so I, I pretty much focused most of my time on investigations and and interviewing witnesses and being at the scene and, and seeing some incredible cases. Actually, some absolutely incredible cases. Yeah, sure, uh, there is quite a few of them out there. Yeah. Yeah, and over 52 years, I mean, it's like I've seen a lot, heard a lot, you know. I'm, I've probably investigated over a thousand cases easily. Uh, uh, and then, of course, my role in MUFON is was uh, the the star team, and that's star. looking yeah. look, looking at uh, the star team manager. And I was looking at trying to find evidence, you know, to get evidence as much as we can, as quick as we can. And uh, and then I'm also on the top. Uh, there's a top tens uh, committee. That, that supports the science review board. And we, I actually, and we, we look at like hundreds of cases each month and analyze those cases. And so I'm, I'm constantly digging in and looking at cases that are just absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, I'm sure ahead. you've seen the crap out there though. Haven't you? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, you do. Yeah. The, yeah. I mean, you, you get that. I mean, but you know yeah. something, I mean, it's a small percentage of, uh, of hoaxes, uh, as opposed to more people just misidentifying Mis things. Misidentifying. Now that's the big thing. Is that yeah. uh, it's a red and green flashing lights? It's going to be a plane. I mean, yeah. that's the marker lights on a plane. And I've had people say, "Look, there's a UFO," and that's like, "That's a plane. It's coming at you." Yeah. Well, uh, one thing that, that you find out that's interesting is that that uh, there are hella, uh, there are military aircraft that will shut lights off. They don't. They they can run without the lights and stuff like sure. that. Which, 
and so that throws people. And then you have the uh, even the ISS going across sometimes. Yeah, across. that one's. Uh, I actually uh, had to post today. I seen that today. Someone posted a picture of infrared showing a uh, fast-moving light going across the screen. It's, it was obvious to me the ISS. I've seen it before. Same speed, oh, sure. everything. It was. Yeah. And then they said, but there was being trailed by a group of other UFOs. And it goes out of the screen, and then they trail back and look, and there's a flock of birds. <laughs> oh, yeah. Obvious small yeah. flock of birds. It wasn't a bunch of UFOs. I mean... Uh, just a misidentification and things like secure team and they put out them fake videos and uh, yeah, they're famous for that one. Well, yeah. you, did you see the one that that video that showed over Wright Patterson Air Force Base a little while back? Yeah, you wouldn't yes, believe that was secure okay. team and yep. that was obvious fake hoax and it was also. It was a modified picture of the photo that's supposedly of the Black Knight satellite. Mm -hmm. It was identical to the Black Knight satellite, just barely fuzzed and altered a little to yep. look like the same thing. And it's uh, they they make that guy got millions of hits because the news media put it out there that this was something big and he got millions of hits and the guy made a fortune on that and laughs about it all the way to the bank i'm sure <laughs> oh yeah and they're out there like left and right this information mm -hmm. is our big one of our biggest challenges with the ufo phenomena mm -hmm. is that um there's a mythology that's being created based upon seeing the bogus information that that people put up uh there's I mean, even uh, traditional old cases that are we we know all about are being when they keep getting re-aired on even just TV shows. Uh, they they add or change the features of them in such a way that it's now adding to a mythology and it creates the wrong uh, uh, wrong thing. It, so that's we're we're challenged by that, basically. Yep. yep, I surely understand that. That's where a lot of things. Well, the whole thing gets laughed about so much you know there's things like that it just kills me <laughs> but uh we got to take a break here in just a moment again rich but uh when we get back uh mufon has something that's been in the news recently so uh let's uh see where we go from there on that but uh you're listening to the shock factor i'm dave shock and you're listening to the x zone broadcast network <laughs> As host of Dialogue with Divinity, I am thrilled to join the Exxon Broadcast Network and their growing number of affiliates. My quest for a connection to the divine ignited my successful career path as an international spiritual counselor for over 40 years and author of four books and well-known metaphysical educator. My clients call me their spiritual mama. So my job is to offer you a radio show to help you grow spiritually with wisdom and get specific tools from guests who are experts in their field. Tune into Dialogue with Divinity and be part of the conversation with spirit. My goal, your happy soul. For more information, please visit my website at johannacarroll.com. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exome Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, High Tech with Corey Kay, and every minute of the 24-7, 365 programming of the Exome Broadcast Network by calling 712-432-9459, courtesy of TalkStream Live. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 712-432-9459 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 712-432-9459 for the best of paranormal, new age, thought-provoking, sci-fi radio programming 24-7, 365.
Coming soon to the Exxon Broadcast Network is a different perspective with me, Kevin Randall, as your host. We'll be taking a close look at what is happening in the world of UFOs today with side trips into the paranormal. Guests will range from those who are household names to those who have a different perspective on a variety of topics. No topic will be taboo, but there will be tough questions asked as we all search for the truth about UFOs, the paranormal, and those things that excite us. Sometimes we'll agree with a guest and sometimes we won't, but we'll try to keep the program topical. For those of you who would like to read, be sure to visit www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and remember to listen to the other fine programs on the X-Zone Broadcast Network at www.xzbn.net. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st Century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genex provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life is no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. Welcome back to the Shock Factor. I'm your host, Dave Shock, and we have Rich Hoffman still here for the last little segment here. And Rich, in the news lately, I see that MUFON has hired a, uh, a publicity firm, or what is this, to do a little rebranding, is it, the, the MUFON name and brand? Yeah, uh, well, we've, we've hired a company to be able to uh, to help us to market, basically, Uh we're, we're looking to be able to get the word out uh, that we're ex in existence. I mean, there, there are some areas of the country that don't even know about Move On and mm -hmm. what it's about. Oh, and and, and uh, there's also, uh, you know, trying to we, – we, we rely heavily on – I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a charity organization, basically. It's, it's yeah, a, sure. 
And so we rely on being able to do things uh, based upon, you know, people becoming members and coming to conferences and that type thing. So um, Jan decided to, to reach out to a company and, and have that company help out in terms of doing a little bit of rebranding and also, you know, getting the word out uh, and just marketing the uh, as much as we can. We'd like to be able to, uh, you know, triple our membership. Um, and so that's where we're trying to go. I mean, ultimately, and, and you know this, Dave, I mean, we like, I'm working as the, the uh, MUFON Strategic uh, Projects Director. And, and mm -hmm. ultimately, some of the projects that I'm engaged in are, are utilizing technologies to be able to go out into the field. We're, we're never going to be able to solve this phenomenon if we keep just going out and having, you know, interviewing a witness who's right. relating. Yeah, we we spoke yeah. about this before, yeah. like uh, uh, yeah. a few of the projects like ours itself, the exactly. CubeSat project. Yeah, and yeah. I know MUFON re reviewed yeah. it, and uh, uh, yeah. though they didn't donate, but they sure have put the word out and helped out and did an article on us and stuff on the CubeSat project. But yeah, we have what, UFOTOG, uh, UFOdata. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are a few other ones that uh, actually I'd like to work with them because they're going to be ground stations and we're going to be space stations, basically. <laughs> so we're open exactly. There. And yeah, we can corroborate our sightings through MUFON with what we see and they see, what people see on the ground. And, you know, that's it's going to take technology. It, it is. Yes, it, it, that's going to give us the additional data. That's why that, that video that from Homeland Security is so... In, in, incredible. I, I mean, for me in 52 years that I've been dealing with this, it's rare that you get to see something like that in infrared. And so, you know, what we, we need, have a lot to learn from watching infrared or seeing it. And the technology is out there. It's becoming cheaper for us. To, I mean, the general public can do a lot with it. So let's get out there, utilize it, and see if we can get additional data. I think, quite frankly, we don't need another light in the sky report we don't need another you know that, that type thing i mean we, we yeah. need to we we need to to be dealing with uh you know real-time data uh, mm -hmm. and and so that's kind of like where i'm trying to push that and and of course you know that takes money and so uh, plus we're also redesigning our database uh and uh this this case management system we have and and so we're making some wide sweeping changes and uh, and that's, I'm on Jan's staff to help to try to do that. Uh, and I'm very excited about that direction. Well, well that's great because uh, yeah. MUFON has had a lot of bad name here and there. I mean, there's many, I've seen many researchers uh, down MUFON a bit and uh, a lot of actually happened when uh, uh, some years back, I think James Carrion, Carrion mm -hmm. was the uh, director at the time but uh, something about Bigelow coming in and taking a whole bunch of uh, uh, documents or something and taking off with them or something similar to that. Can you comment anything about that? Yeah, well, that's so. a you know a long term old old story that will just because it's on the internet it'll never die. But anyway, bottom line was we had a, a contract with Bigelow and Bigelow got engaged with Mufon and then then there was almost like an attempt at a hostile takeover. And uh, and that's when we kind of like backed off and, and basically killed the the uh, killed that project and our connection with them. And I'm very happy that we did. They said yeah, the one, the one thing that we the one thing that did come out of it, though, was the star team. And basically that was about getting out and getting evidence and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've pretty much have put Bigelow aside. Glad that we did that. But at the same time, I mean, we didn't need a hostile takeover and uh, we didn't need uh bigelow directing move on we have a board for that right right and you don't need a, a one person exactly. set up like that right and yeah. people, a lot of people just didn't trust bigelow's uh, uh his idea of what was going to happen there a lot of people just didn't see that as a good thing and it, the rumors out there like i said right now this is good that i did not know what you told me and this is good to know this right <laughs> But, uh, you know, we get the laugh factor so much, you know. Whoa, there was a reporting of a UFO. <laughs> and then they give the laugh, you know, the, how the media, mainstream media handles the thing. It's just, it, it's aggravating 
that when they try to make this a serious thing or even our project, when they talked about, they did an interview with uh, our project manager, Dave Cote, who's, uh, you know, for the CubeSat project. And the news media that did it, interviewed him in Canada. They say uh, a local guy was going to, and they laugh, you know, about, you know, they laugh about the project and they didn't take it seriously. You know, it's just, I don't know what it's going to take. This rebranding of MUFON may be a great idea to help help in the media a bit so we don't get this laugh factor so much. Well, I, I hate to say it, but I think that that's always going to be there. I think that what you have is, even going back to the, you know, in the early 50s when the Robertson panel met and the CIA got involved in mm -hmm. trying to shape the message, they knew that the media would play an active role in being able to shape it. And they also know completely about psyops and all the other things that you needed to do. So ultimately, if you look at the uh, the weekly tabloids that were out, maybe, you know, you you go through the checkouts and you can you know, we're going to check out for your food. And you find that they would have pictures of Hillary holding an alien baby. And then you know, had, I've seen that. Yeah. I, I, well, seen that stupid and then, then you. <laughs> then you find out that the the, the guy that was running the, uh, the the tabloids and stuff like that was actually uh, connected to the CIA. So I mean, you know, then you then you start to realize how much that they're out there playing that kind of role. And so I mean, there's yeah. been a massive movement to 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 make this thing and discredit it, and that's always going to be there. They've done it a good job with it. Uh, then you have all of the, the, the disinformation and the misinformation that, that you continues to go on. So the natural response is to, to laugh at this whole thing and to not be interested in it. And it's only the serious people who actually look into it or even, you know, the people who are critical about, uh, the want to be critical about MUFON uh, probably have never even read the, the MUFON journal, never attended one of the conferences, and they just want to sit back and, and just throw stones at it. For whatever reasons, because they're uh, either because it, you know, we do something differently than they do, or they're jealous, or they're they're upset that we've got all the data in the database and we are. Uh, and I just don't know how people can laugh at the subject because this could be the greatest find in human history. When I mean, this is, could be, and to laugh at such a subject, I mean, if they're here or not, uh, I, I seen something myself, it's, it's unexplainable. I did, I reported to MUFON, they even came out, took photos, interviewed me, they were out twice, they were really good about it, but I don't, I didn't hear nothing really afterwards if they got any radar data or whatever happened on that, but uh, I'd like to know that, Mayor Pack Rich, but... <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, September of 2013 in Denver. There you go. But uh, it was amazing, really exciting. But, you know, this could be the most amazing thing in human history. Uh, sure. Being visited, uh, the alien crafts, could we learn from them, you know? But is yeah. the government hiding it or not? I don't think, I honestly don't think they know as much as people think. They seem to think we're just having coffee with them. They're sitting in the White House and got their own office or whatever. I just don't think it's as, as much as that. Because you see, when report Stevensville, they have scrambled F-16s after the darn mm -hmm. thing and chased it as it headed towards the president branch, what I understand. And yeah, we, we have that on radar off, too. They chased it. Right, right. Yeah. There's radar data. They chased it and off it went, you know. So uh, that's why I don't think they know it as much as they are because they're chasing after them. They're, they're, it ain't like they're already knew it was going to be there. And oh, we already know. Don't bother with it, you know. But I, I just don't think it's as much as people make it out to be. I really don't. By the way, Libby, uh, uh, we've been talking a lot about the Aguadilla case. There's a, a website you can go to, which is uh, Explore, E-X-P-L-O-R-E, S-C-U, Sam Charlie Uniform, dot O-R-G. Uh, and that's where you can see the video. You can also see our 162-page paper that we put together. You can see the radar information that we have, and, and uh, people can look there uh, and see it for themselves. Well, that's great. Yeah, that, that's interesting. The video is well worth seeing. Uh, I, I was truly amazed, especially when you hear that this is Homeland Security footage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's amazing to see it. I mean, this is a yep. honest-to-goodness thing. 
I mean, it ain't like this was faked by a secure team or that people. Exactly. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, this is the real deal. And that's what uh, has amazed me about that, that whole uh, footage. And uh, thanks for doing a good report on it. Two years, 7,000 some frames. Oh, my gosh. Yep. <laughs> that is amazing. Uh, did you get to actually talk to the pilots? Uh, yep, we sure did. Okay. Well, yeah, well, I guess we got to go, Rich. I want to thank you for coming on. Appreciate it. Fellow Daytonian. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yep. I want you to take care, and we'll talk again soon, one of these days soon. And uh, everyone, thanks for tuning in. The X-Zone Broadcast Network. This is the Shock Factor. I'm your host, Dave Shock. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.